Hitler did not fight World War II all by himself. Did they stay so loyal even after defeat was certain? Um, they often claim it was because of their oath. But, but, but I think it's more complicated than that because German officers took all kinds of oaths in their career. They took an oath to serve the Weimar Republic. <laughs> they served an oath to, to defend the constitution of the Weimar Republic, which included um, obedience and, uh, uh, to the restrictions of the Versailles Treaty. As, so they broke the one to the constitution and they violated the Versailles Treaty any moment they got. So, you know, the, we all know this. There's oaths and there's oaths. And apparently the Germans, uh, German officers felt that as well. But let me give uh, four quick reasons why I think uh, we might say, I think we make the argument, what caused the German army the German officer corps especially to remain in the field. Certainly, uh, one factor that kept them fighting so tenaciously was their fear of Soviet revenge. Should the Red Army break into Germany? They all said that in their memoirs and I think it's actually true. The, uh, the, they knew exactly what they had done in the Soviet Union. They had good reason to be worried. And Soviet troops did indeed behave atrociously on, on German soil, killing and looting and raping as a horror. But still today, it's a horrible story. I think the Soviet Union lost the Cold War in the, first, the last moments of World War II by its behavior in Berlin. So they had good reason to, to fear Soviet, the, the, uh, Soviet revenge, and maybe that was what kept them in the field. A second factor that they often uh, uh, call to mind is the Allied declaration at the Casablanca Conference in 1943 that the Allies were fighting for unconditional surrender. So there seemed to be no real alternative, the generals claim, but to fight on till the, till the bitter end. Now, it is, it's a rare thing, if you study military history, to demand unconditional surrender from your adversary. Typically, when the adversary's been beaten, emissary, and knows he's been beaten, emissaries are sent out and to some neutral corner, and, and some kind of armistice is hammered out, and then that leads to a peace treaty. So the Germans claim that. I mean, we can at least, we could argue it, but at least we'll leave it hanging out there and say it, it's, a, it's plausible. It's a prima facie case you can make for unconditional surrender. But here's something they didn't say in their memoirs that we know all too well today. Hitler was bribing them all to the hilt, providing them with what were called in German a dotationen. We, the, the translation into English is a word we don't use. It's an archaicism, dotations an old Prussian word for uh, an award from the king. That is, uh, you have done, you've done service to the monarch and then the monarch in his gratitude to, to you pays you, a, a, pays you a, 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 some kind of reward. Now, in the German context of 1944-45, these were immense cash payments deposited directly into general's bank accounts. Every month the war went on. There were more bonuses for special events. Uh, for example, 250,000 Reichsmarks for your 50th or 60th birthday. I'm very, it's very tough to exactly what does that mean in today's money and today's purchasing power, but let's estimate two to three million dollars. So a bonus for your 50th or 60th birthday. They also received huge landed estates in the occupied territories, carved out of land, seized from their rightful owners, and you all know where the rightful owners probably were by this point, either dead or in, in camp somewhere awaiting, uh, awaiting their deaths. L late in the war, October of 1944, Erich von Manstein, one of the great German field marshals and one of the most skilled military operators of the 20th century, um, sent out his scouts in, into Pomerania to, to look for a suitable landed estate. You know, the Soviet armies were probably 22 miles, 25 miles away. You might hear the artillery fire in the background. And the notion that Manstein was ever going to, I don't know, curl up in front of the fireplace with a pipe and, and, rela and have a relaxing evening on his new estate is, is, uh, is laughable. It calls into question, I suppose, his strategic acumen. Uh, uh, perhaps he was merely trying to do that to lay a claim for any kind of post-war settlement. That's, that's what I've always thought at any rate. So I have the deed to this property if, there ever, if that ever did matter in, the kind of, in some kind of post-war settlement. Maybe memory made them do it. I've thought about this one a lot, and in fact, a lot of my book is about this, this fourth point. Maybe memory made them do it. We have to remember that these were the same officers who had fought and lost the previous time out. They fought and lost World War I. To a man, they believed they had lost because Germany threw in the towel too soon. And Germany had thrown in the towel too soon due to a kind of rot on the home front. The, the, the infamous phrase that, that still percolates around German historiographical circles is they believed that the army had been stabbed in the back by the home front, by <clears throat> socialists and pacifists, 
vegetarians, all sorts of people who lack the stomach for the fight to the end. And of course, this being the German officer corps, a group that, that, that leaned to the right in any circumstances, and now they've been kind of, they've been radicalized in, in, the, in the current formulation. That also included Germany's Jews. There's a massive uptick in anti-Semitism amongst the German officer corps after World War I as well. So, rot on the home front. That's one thing that didn't seem to be happening in 1944 and 1945. Hitler seemed to have solved that problem. The German people were standing firm behind Hitler. And in fact, they would till the, till the very end. So there was no one amongst them, really, amongst the officer corps, who wished to be the first to stand up and say what many of them were privately thinking. We've lost. And so they fought on, again, through one bloody campaign after the other. By far, the bloodiest year of World War II is the last year of the war. That surprises us sometimes. Wars sometimes trail off at the end and come to, everyone loses momentum, but that's not how World War II went. World War II just ended in a bloodbath, and that was the final year of the war. You know, interestingly enough, there's, a, there's one component from this list, one item from this list that's missing. None of them ever said they were afraid. We didn't do it because we were afraid of Hitler. Afraid for our lives. Afraid that Hitler would kill them if they disobeyed. He had relatively few generals executed in the course of the war. A handful, in matter of fact. Uh, probably about 10 arrested and a handful of that actually, uh, actually uh, executed. Uh, unlike Stalin, who, who executed so, uh, generals by the, by the bucket load all through the war, especially in the early years of the war. If we can say one thing about a typical German general, this is probably absolutely unafraid of death. They tended to command from the front, which is why so many of them died and were, uh, were killed, I should say, in the course of military action in the Second World War. The number that is usually uh, pointed to by historians, you, can, you have to argue a little bit both ways, 676 German generals killed in the fighting in World War II. Uh, compared to, I don't know the exact number for the Americans, it's, it's in double digits. Less than 50, certainly, and probably a, a lot less than that. Just not how American generals played the game. They weren't in the front line carrying out a reconnaissance through field glasses. They tended to be administrators. I'm thinking of a Courtney Hodges or a, or, or a, a William Simpson behind the lines and making sure that the logistics were right and that the administration and organization was tight. So, uh, fear, politics, money, memory. They were all at play in keeping the generals going. Or, or maybe, and as I researched this book, I was forced to confront an unpleasant reality. Maybe some of them just felt like it. And I ask you to consider the case of Field Marshal Ferdinand Scherner. Here was a, a, a truly, you know, for lack of a better term, here was a truly bad guy, a fanatic, National Socialist fanatic, a true believer in Hitler. His operational signature was shooting thousands of his own men for cowardice in order to terrify the others into obedience. He liked to fly to the front. The German commanders have this little Fiesler Stor aircraft. It's quite light. It takes about 50-foot runway to take off. It's incredible. So you can land literally in the, in the middle of the street. He liked to come down in his little command plane up, up the front, do a brief inspection, then meet out death sentences on the flimsiest of evidence. After the attempt on Hitler's life in July of 1944, uh, Schoener would open staff meetings by asking his officers around the table, how many men did you hang today? He seemed to, th he seemed to think it was an important aspect of, of command. How many men did you hang today? On several occasions, he had dogs shot who were barking too loudly outside his, outside his command post. You know, you're reading this, so I already read that account, and they say, no, this is apparently a different dog. So it happened on more than one account. Uh, more than one um, uh, occurrence. He once visited a tank repair shop where a crew was waiting to get a vehicle fixed, and Scherner had the commander shot for malingering. He once had 22 men shot for the crime of standing around without orders. He was driving around late, late in the war. This is, this is very late in the war, and the and, uh, troop had, was, it was at rest for a moment, and he ordered them executed, apparently for no reason at all. All this took place again in the very end of the war, with Germany collapsing in ruins all around him, and Hitler uh, you know, getting ready and then actually killing himself. The retreat path of Schoener's armies was marked by thousands of German soldiers hung from lampposts on charges of cowardice, uh, a malingering desertion, and the like. He appalled many of his own colleagues, which always says something. <laughs> People tolerate almost anything, but if you ask, what, what, you ask their colleagues what, what they're like. Um, he appalled many of his own colleagues. One fellow general, Dietl it was, 
one said, Ferdy, Ferdinand, Ferdy, who do you think you are? A cop? You know, in other words, the art of command is not catching your men in various uh, 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 forms of, of disobedience to regulations. The art of command is commanding and commanding towards victory, hopefully. Ferdinand was acting more like a cop in the uh, a term of uh, opprobrium to his fellow officers. Just days before the end of the war, Ferdinand Scherner was commanding Army Group Center in Bohemia with today Czech Republic. He issued his last order of the day to his troops. A quote, in these hard days, we must not lose our nerves or become cowards. Any man abandoning his post will suffer the most dire consequences. He threatened to hang, in other words, any man abandoning his post. Now, a few days later, Scherner got into his private aircraft and abandoned his post. He was facing the Russians, and as you might expect, he had no desire to fall into the hands of the Russians. Who do you want, who do you want to be taken prisoner by? The Western forces, the British or Americans. So he abandoned his men to their fate as Soviet POWs, uh, reached the safety of US lines, and this makes me proud to be an American. We handed him back over to the Soviets, um, <laughs> who, who held him as a prisoner for the, for the next 10 years, uh, doing time next to the very men he had left in the lurch. And he often had to be protected by Soviet guards from his own men while in prison. He was freed in late 1954. He returned to West Germany, what was West Germany now, uh, to angry outbursts from many of his former soldiers and their families. Uh, he went on trial there too, and he spent four more years in prison. Um, when he got out in 1959, I want to say, because I think the trial was 55, I have a letter. It was, he was in Munich at the time. He'd been a, he's a Bavarian by birth. So he was in Munich at the time. I have a letter that he wrote to the Bavarian transport um, asking why he had not been granted the free train pass that was his due as a returning veteran. And I never saw the answer, but I, there, there are a couple, there's a couple ways we could answer that question. So the point is, <clears throat> Scherner, almost unheard of today, next to the Monsteins and the Guderians and the, and the Rommels, the people I've spent my career uh, uh, writing about, but the Scherners are kind of unknown today. But, but he is a prime example of a late war German general. He was loyal, all right, but loyal up, loyal to Hitler. There, there's, there's many different kinds of loyalty expected of a military commander, and one of them, of course, is loyalty to the men under your command, some concern for the lives of the men who are serving under your command. You know, I'll end with the, uh, the, the words of wisdom from the dean of World War II historians, the kind of pope of our field, Gerhard Weinberg, who once described the end of the war with this phrase, uh, the German war, huge bribes for some at the top, and bullets for thousands at the bottom. It was commanders like Scherner in the end who allowed it to happen, in fact, who, who made it happen. And that would be the, my reminder for today's lesson is that Hitler did not fight World War II all by himself. Thank you very much.